hello and welcome to this commentary for Resident Evil 2, Leon Scenario B. You'll hear from me after the intro. Claire Redfield succeeded in escaping from the city, along with one of the only other survivors. A young girl named Sherry. However, behind their escape was the lone survivor of the Raccoon City Police Department. Leon S. Kennedy. got here guys a maniac why'd he bite me What's up with that guy? That was a clean hit. Going on. I arrived in town and the whole place went Great. insane. The radio's out. You're a cop, right? Yeah. First day on the job. Great, huh? Name's Leon Kennedy. Nice to meet you. Mine's Claire. Claire Redfield. I came to find my brother Chris. Did you open the glove box? Sure. There's a gun inside. You better take it with you. I'll meet you there. Okay. At the same time, at the same place, 
You have to survive this nightmare to know the true end. So for those of you who have just started watching this one, um, even though it has been a title, this is the second playthrough of Resident Evil 2. So this only becomes unlocked once you've played through Scenario A as Claire Redfield. So this is supposed to really kind of fill in some of the blanks that we had going on. And as well as that, this is what I would characterize as being hard mode, which makes sense that it comes second. The difficulty of Scenario B massively ramps up from Scenario A. Disappointingly, we don't spend a huge amount of time in Raccoon City before getting to the police station. One of my most enduring memories from playing Resident Evil games as a kid was the first few uh, kind of, not rooms, but areas, I suppose probably be a better way of describing it, as you originally make your way to the police station, from coming across the gun shop owner to all of the other zombies, um, make along the way this time we don't spend too much time in in fact we're already in essentially the police station now but it has a, a bit of a callback if you watch the scenario a playthrough you'll recognize that as the area where we picked up the bow gun and also the area where i said do not open that door because there will be zombies that come through and this i guess kind of explains why there were zombies banging on that door because they're still following leon after his escape from the initial crash And that explains why the helicopter was crashed and burning in Scenario A. Imagine being such an inept police officer that you get taken out by two regular ass zombies while you have a machine gun. You know. But anyways, we start off at the backside of the police station for Scenario B. And you will notice that things ramp up much quicker this time round than in Scenario A. In fact, in the very next room there are two liquors which are just going to appear without any fanfare. Because we've already seen it before, you know. It's, we, we know kind of what to expect. Um, there are going to be a number of documents round, which canonically Claire should have picked up and they shouldn't be there, but they still are. So if you haven't watched my um, commentary of Scenario A, I will be reading through all of them. Um, except for a few circumstances, what I tend to do is flip the pages quite quickly and then carry on reading. So you hear it as I progress through. Secretary Diary A, April 6th. I accidentally moved one of the stone statues on the second floor when I leaned against it. When the chief found out about it, he was furious. I swear the guy nearly bit my head off, screaming at me never to touch the statue again. If it's so important, then maybe he shouldn't have put it out in the open like that. April 7th. I heard that all the art pieces from the chief's collection are rare items, literally worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. I don't know which is the bigger mystery where he finds those tacky things, or where he's getting the money to pay for them. May 10th. I wasn't surprised to see the chief come in today with yet another large picture frame in his hands. This time, it was a really disturbing painting depicting a nude person being hanged. I was appalled by the expression on the chief's face as he leered at that painting. Why anyone would consider something like that to be a work of art is beyond my comprehension. If the secretary thinks that that painting is disturbing, then she's never clearly seen the painting of Saturn devouring his son. I believe it was painted by a gentleman called Goya. I think he was relatively advanced in age when he painted it. And uh, from what I know, he had like recently suffered from two life-threatening illnesses and painted like the walls of his house with it. Um, I I, I guess being concerned of his mortality and it was never really meant to be seen outside um, of his own home but I, it is in some art gallery or museum somewhere now. Um, it's actually quite grisly even though it is an old painting so if you are going to google just a little warning there so you can't say I didn't tell you so. 
So there's a few files in Scenario B, the which um, are common in both Scenario A and Scenario B. A few obviously that only appear in one and a few that only appear in two. So uh, just in case I've forgotten which ones I have and haven't said previously, uh, or in case you haven't watched the previous video, I'm just going to be reading through all of them in that kind of manner. So the Unicorn Medal on this scenario um, appears a little bit differently. In Scenario A, we would get the Unicorn Medal underneath Chris's diary in the stars room but a few things have uh, been rearranged for scenario B it's I, I guess kind of similar I, I guess you could argue with um, the, the way you would have a rearranged mode in the original Resident Evil and yet the shotgun just lying out in the open which I, I, I guess makes sense like they've been fighting um, zombies and whatnot so maybe someone like was dying and left it there or maybe they put it there as like um so something they could come back to as a retreat point in case the um, the facility gets more overrun. So the shotgun's just out in the open relatively early on, uh, but it kind of makes sense for why it's there. And much like in Resident Evil 1, uh, Claire kind of takes on the role almost of Jill Valentine with the lockpick, and Leon more of Chris Redfield, hence why he has to use small keys to unlock uh, like small small desks and whatnot. Usually there's nothing uh, like key item wise, nothing important in that regard. It's just a little bit of ammunition to help you on. So you can completely forego using the small keys um, completely if you want to. I wouldn't recommend it because you're just making it harder for yourself. And as I've mentioned previously, scenario B is a much harder scenario than the first one. But we're just going to open and unlock the door and move down to the... I'm not sure what this room is. Evidence room, I think. There's lots of documents around here. And I'll also make sure um, every time you come across any kind of uh, dead bodies, you uh, pick up the ammunition from them. Uh, there's going to be a bit of a recurring theme in that a lot of the puzzles that you solved in Scenario A, you're going to have to solve again, even though, canonically speaking, they should already be solved. For instance, you can see over to the right of the screen that there is a valve. The same valve that Claire uses to douse the burning helicopter in water. So it doesn't make any sense that the helicopter's fire has been put out in both scenarios. Like it's been put out twice. Unless some asshole came and reignited it and the other character had to then put it out again. Like it doesn't... It, it, it's a, a few logical inconsistencies with that, which I, I know it's, you know... It's just a game, it shouldn't bug me nearly as much as it um, does, but it's one of those those things that irks me, because I, I, I always wonder if they, they couldn't have perhaps made some other kind of trigger, and then had Claire on the radio saying, oh, I've, I've, I've taken care of the fire outside, you know, it's safe now. Rather than having to do it twice, um, it just kind of, it, it messes with my... Suspension of disbelief, not cognitive dissonance. I'm not sure what the term is, but it irks me. Yeah, we'll just, we'll just go with irksome. It irks me. And, for instance, opening up the safe there. I mean, that was opened up in Claire's, and we don't have to get the same file. It's always 2236. So, even though we've not read that file, we know it because we played through the first scenario. And, what the hell? What the hell was that? Sorry, that's that's that was a weird audio glitch in the original walkthrough. Um... I'm going to blame the emulator for that one. <laughs> so yeah, we're going to go out and we're going to douse the flame, which triggers possibly the biggest change between Scenario A and Scenario B. And if you've only played the remake, um, might not seem as obvious as, as far as I'm aware. Again, I haven't played the remake, but as far as I'm aware, uh, Mr. X himself appears in both scenarios. If I'm wrong on that, I probably just sound like an idiot now. But in this game, Mr. X, X gone, give it to you himself, only appears in Scenario B, and that's one of the things that makes it so much more difficult. Not only do you have to deal with a couple of fights with William Birkin, but Mr. X is also gone, give it to you. <laughs> I saw, I saw so many mods for the remake of Resident Evil 2, where it was, it was like dressed as Ricardo or something else. It's like, oh my god! And here is his original entrance.
So Mr. X is a form of tyrant, which if you're unfamiliar with the Resident Evil lore, because it's quite frankly insane and batshit at this point, a lot of the reason they were doing the experiments, not just to create the ultimate bioweapon, as they'll say multiple times, and th there's some stuff to do with like enhancing humans and immortality, etc. that comes up as well, but a, a big staple is creating these tyrants, which is a, a main area of research they were after and the whole point is that you create these very strong creatures which are capable of following commands so unlike the zombies unlike the lickers and all the other stuff that just want to go out and kill things the tyrants are controllable to an extent usually with a lot of the tyrants once they've taken a lot of damage they kind of go on a bit of a rampage and that's why it was dropped in by a helicopter because this is Umbrella basically trying to clean up loose ends. So if, again, if you've gone through, I'm going to keep saying that and sound like a broken record, I do apologise. Um, for Scenario A, we kind of learnt that Chief Irons was corrupt and working with Umbrella and actively trying to undermine the effort of the STARS members, so Chris Redfield, Jill Valentine and other members of STARS because they were working to expose Umbrella. And that's him, that's just signalling to us, yeah, we've, we've taken him out, but not really, he will be back. And he... he shows up multiple times throughout this. He's not quite as omnipresent as Nemesis is in 3. And quite ironically, actually, um, in the remakes, Mr. X acts more like Nemesis, while Nemesis acts more like Mr. X. God, they fucked up the 3 remake. I can't even say they fucked it up. It's depressingly mediocre, I think, is the, is the way of putting it. It's not, it's not even mediocre. It's a, it's a good enough game. There's nothing wrong with it. But the expectations were so high, given both how good Seconds remake was and also how good the original source was. Like, Resident Evil 3 is my favourite of the original games. And that's why it hit so hard for me with how... I mean, I haven't actually played it, but I've seen other people play for it because I heard how disappointing it was. And yeah, yeah, I have to agree with that. Anyways, before I got massively sidetracked, so that's two liquors taken out for the price of one. So I, I kind of mentioned in the first one that Claire gets access to the bow gun, whereas Leon gets access to the shotgun. The bow gun is woefully inadequate at taking out liquors. In fact, the bow gun is woefully inadequate at taking out anything other than zombies. Um, the shotgun, on the other hand, really, really good for him. Much, much better weapon than the bow gun, because as we can see, it every time you fire, you get that sunlight, in fact, two shells, and it's down. Obviously not as effective as a grenade launcher, and obviously not as effective as a grenade launcher firing acid rounds, which, up until you come across the enhanced liquors towards the later end of the game in the lab, will just one-bang them, just take them out in one go. But the shotgun is much more effective than the bow gun because the... It has enough of a kickback to stun lock them, and that's something that the bowgun doesn't do. Um, it just kind of whimpers a little bit, as if you shot it with a pistol, and then just slices your face off anyway. Uh, bowgun, really, really bad. Really, really bad at using for liquors. I know I mentioned that in the fir first scenario, but don't use it for liquors. And if you're wondering why we have a rocket launcher with unlimited ammo, uh, that's because in the scenario A, we completed it in a short enough amount of time, used few enough first aid kits and saved infrequently enough to get an A grade, which will unlock that. Which would make... I, I, I kind of wish that you weren't able to unlock it until you've completed both scenarios. Because it, it just feels kind of cheap having it available here. This is... Oh, excuse me. Uh, for the this particular save that we're going through, this is the first time I've gone through B scenario and I already have access to a rocket launcher even though I've not actually done it. And yeah, actually, thinking about it, um, we even we, we have the opportunity to open the safe before we would even get to the point where we could get the file to see that the code was 2236. Sorry, it just kind of occurred to me. But yeah, I, I wish that it would only unlock once you've done both of them rather than straight away, because <laughs> if you want to get the a, a, a good grade on this scenario, you can't use it. So if we wanted to make it easy for us, we, you know, we have access to it, but I don't know, it just, it just seems, I don't know, I, I guess I've just gotten so used to it only once you've completed everything that it rubs me the wrong way a little bit. 
now this part I'm, I'm a little bit uncertain of because I again I don't know if it's a case of it being chronological I'm not sure if the shutters were down there because in Claire's scenario we put them down and that's them breaking or if it's a case that they were originally down the fuse broke now they're open to let zombies in and Claire would have to now, in fact, that doesn't, that doesn't work, actually. That doesn't work because when we went through there was Claire. Again, I'm I'm sorry. I'm going to complain about continuity um, a lot throughout this. This is the reason why I'm not allowed to watch movies with any of my friends because all I do is complain about every slight mistake. Um, <laughs> especially Jurassic Park. There's, there's a really big one in Jurassic Park where a T-Rex breaks through the wires and then like a few scenes later they're abseiling down the hole that the T-Rex broke into except now of it being flatland it's now a fucking hole that you can abseil down. When, once we get to the, the later half of this there won't be anything for me to complain about so we can just we can relax then. So even though some of the continuity is off, I do like the fact that a lot of these cutscenes you get to see from the other point of view. And you can see exactly why they were in the position they were as you come through. Claire, you made it. Yeah. Have you seen a little girl around here? Yeah, you just missed her. Who is she? I don't know. But it's too dangerous for her to stay here alone. Leon? I'll go look for her. You go and find us a way out of here. Of course. But before I forget, here's a radio. That way we can keep in touch if something comes up. So playing that cut scene from Leon's point of view this time, and because it's us who is actually controlling Leon, it's him who moves from the spot and Claire is left standing, twiddling her thumbs until you leave the room. So if you use the small key on that drawer there, you'll pick up some handgun parts. And that's a recurring theme throughout Leon's playthrough. The handgun, the shotgun and the magnum all get parts to upgrade them and I think that's one of the reasons why you end up getting all three of them really early on. Um, as I say that, we've got the bow gun and the grenade launcher quite early on in Claire's so, so that analogy doesn't really work. There's a bit more of a progression with Leon's campaign because you can upgrade these weapons. Now, I was very carefully counting my bullets at that point because you don't want to upgrade the handgun straight away and, and that goes for all of the weapons. When you attach the extra parts to the weapon, it will refill the ammunition of that gun. So if you were to use the handgun parts when you have full magazine, you don't get that benefit. So it's far more prudent with all of the weapons to wait until you've run out of ammunition and then use the parts on them and then you get a full clip. So it's just, you know, free ammo, more bang for your buck. So we're going to make our way into the stars room, make your way over to the locker to pick up the magnum. And on the desk, well, there isn't a unicorn medallion, but there is Chris's diary. Chris's diary. August 8th. I talked to the chief today once again, but he refused to listen to me. I know for certain that Umbrella conducted T-virus research in that mansion. Anyone infected turns into a zombie. But the entire mansion went up in that explosion, along with any incriminating evidence. Since Umbrella employs so many people in town, no one is willing to talk about the incident. It looks like I'm running out of options. August 17th. We've been receiving a lot of local reports about strange monsters appearing at random throughout the city. This must be the work of Umbrella. August 24th. With the help of Jill and Barry, I finally obtained information vital to this case. Umbrella has begun research on the new G-Virus, a variation of the original T-Virus. Haven't they done enough damage already? We talked it over, and have decided to fly to the main Umbrella HQ in Europe. I won't tell my sister about this trip, because doing so could put her in danger. Please forgive me. Claire. 
So unlike in Claire's playthrough, as we leave the stars room, we don't have a fax come through. And I think a big reason for that is the fax mostly concerns some information about Chief Irons, who isn't going to be making an appearance in Leon's campaign. And it kind of just mentions the fact that the Chief seems to be under, well, seems to be being bribed by Umbrella and some of the character traits of him being a little bit dodgy, chiefly that he had rape allegations when he was back at college. But making our way down, uh, we're going to be going into a room that we didn't actually go into in Claire's playthrough just because I was trying to make the walkthrough as succinct as possible when it wasn't necessary for the completion, and that is the storage room here. Operation Report 2 September 28th Early morning, 2.30am Zombies overran the operation room and another battle broke out. We lost four more people, including David. We're down to four people, including myself. We failed to secure the weapons cache and hope for our survival continues to diminish. We won't last much longer. We agreed upon a plan to escape through the sewer. There's a path leading from the precinct underground to the sewage disposal plant. We should be able to access the sewers through there. The only drawback is that there is no guarantee the sewage disposal plant is free of any possible dangers. We know our chances in the sewers are slim, but anything is better than simply waiting here to die. In order to buy more time, we locked the only door leading to the underground, which is located in the eastern office. We left the key behind in the western office, since it's unlikely that any of those creatures have the intelligence to find it and unlock the door. I pray that this operation report will be helpful to whoever may find it. Recorder, Elliot Edward. So towards the end of that storage room we were just in is the dark room. And in both scenarios there are film items that you can pick up. And if you go to the back there you can develop them and it will give you a little picture of a photo. Which I haven't done for quite a few of the film items, especially in Claire's... Um, playthrough uh, purely because I thought it would make the walkthrough a little bit less succinct having to do a little bit of backtracking when it wasn't strictly speaking necessary. Uh, in hindsight I kind of wish I had done just to have a bit of a, a completionist playthrough just to show off all the different items that you can collect and just to make sure that nothing's missed out but I, I mean that said if you're interested you can always just go look up one of the numerous wikis and uh, find what those photos say anyway. Memo to Leon. To Leon S. Kennedy. Congratulations on your assignment to the Raccoon City Police Department. We all look forward to having you as part of our team and promise to take good care of you. Welcome aboard. From all the guys at the RPD. Surely it should say, from all the guys and gals at the RPD. You absolute sexists. Although back then we weren't as... Well, back in 1998, we weren't as insane with that kind of thing as we are today. I mean, certain languages literally have genders in, like, describing tables. What are you going to do about those? Police Memorandum. 8th of the 23rd, 1998. This letter is just to inform everyone about the recent movement of equipment that has happened during the precinct's rearrangement. The safe with four-digit lock has been moved from the star's office on the second floor to the eastern office on the first floor. 2236. Raccoon Police Liaison Department. So yeah, kind of redundant. We already know what the security safe code number is. Although I always find this room quite interesting on this playthrough as it's one of the few examples in a Resident Evil game where there are enemies inside a room with the safety deposit box. Though that said, it's not playing the music that you would normally hear when you get to a safe room, so that kind of gives away a bit of a hint there. So from the desk there, I said there's no we uh, weapon parts like the handgun parts, obviously just some shotgun shells, but you know, you can't go wrong with a few extra shells in a Resident Evil game, can you? And you notice, yeah, that room was uh, mostly packed with zombies because they seem to have made their way through this room where they originally broke through and it seems as if they've kind of like made their way over to that area. Now I mentioned the fact that you shouldn't be using the upgrade parts for your weapons until you're 
ammo count is low so that you get some free ammo out of it. I actually mentioned what it makes a difference. Uh, you might have noticed a few times when you hold down the stock, it will fire, like, it will do a triple fire essentially. It's like a three round burst, which is kind of awful to be honest. You want to have more controlled shots and firing three round bursts like that is a surefire way to waste ammunition. However, it is also useful to have the stock on it because, well, as well as the fact that you get a free clip of ammunition, the recoil time between each shot is much less. So you can pump the damage out quicker. It's just a case that you have to have a bit more of trigger discipline uh, when using it. And those zombies get me every time. <laughs> so yeah, to try and spice things up so you don't get too complacent with running through the police station there's a few times where zombies will kind of break in uh, i think it's also to give a sense that the environment you're in isn't static as well like we've seen that there's been police that have died trying to defend this place so operation report september 26th the raccoon police department was unexpectedly attacked by zombies many have been injured even more were killed during the attack our communications equipment was destroyed and we no longer have contact with the outside. We have decided to carry out an operation with the intent of rescuing any possible survivors as well as to prevent this disaster from spreading beyond Raccoon City. The details of the operation are as follows. Security of armaments and ammunition. Chief Irons has voiced concern regarding the issue of terrorism due to a series of recent unresolved incidents. On the very days before the zombies attack, he made the decision to relocate all weapons to scattered intervals throughout the building as a temporary measure to prevent their possible seizure. Unfortunately, this decision has made it extremely difficult for us to locate all ammunition caches. It has become our top priority to recover these scattered munitions to unlock the weapon storage. As stated earlier, it will be extremely difficult to secure all the ammunition. However, a considerable supply still remains in the underground weapon storage. Unfortunately, the person in charge of the card key used to access the weapon storage is missing and we've been unable to locate the key. One of the breakers went down during the battle and the electronic locks are not functioning in certain areas. It has become a top priority to restore the power in the power room and secure those locks. Recorder, David Ford. Operation Report, September 27th, 1 p.m. The West Barricade has been broken through and another exchange ensued. We sheltered the injured in the confiscation room on the first floor temporarily. 12 more people were injured in the battle. Recorder, David Ford. Additional Report, Three additional people were killed following the sudden appearance of an as-of-yet unknown creature. This creature is identified by missing patches of skin and razor-like claws. However, its most distinguishing characteristic is its lance-like tongue, capable of piercing a human torso in an instant. Their numbers, as well as their location, remains unknown. We have tentatively named this creature the Licker, and are currently in the process of developing countermeasures to deal with this new threat. So back in the room that we were in previously where you have to place the two red jewels, unfortunately there are no skydiving liquors this time round. That was just a one-off occurrence, thankfully. And much like with Claire's, we're going to get the same cutscene opening up. And you'll notice with the cutscene it specifically doesn't show what's inside the chest because it's different for each playthrough. With Claire's you get a part of the stone which you use in, well, use behind Brian Irons' desks to get into the sewer. And with Leon you get one of the chest pieces because we're going to be using a slightly different route to get down to the sewers. Uh, speaking of which, which we are going to head to now. I did do my best, again, for both of the playthroughs to try and take the route of not least resistance, but what I deemed would be the fastest way of working through it. It's, it's kind of similar with both Resident Evil 1 and Resident Evil 2. I <laughs>
played through it several times to get it right. I looked up a few other guides and I had like a, a notepad just scribbled of all notes like right go here go here go here just to to the to the right of me to hand the entire time just in case that I accidentally went awry and started going in the one direction because both the police station and the mansion are complete mazes especially when items change around from scenario to scenario it can be quite difficult when you're familiar with the rooms but not with the order that you're meant to go into like it's more difficult when you know a different way of going through it from a previous scenario because then you, or at least for me at least, I start to, my, my brain almost switches into that mode and I just start running to wrong places. So I think this is one of the quicker ways of getting through these games. I do try to make my walkthroughs as succinct as possible. Uh, not that you'd believe it. That was a double, wasn't it? Didn't even see and um, get fucked. <laughs> Uh, not that you would notice with some of my lengthier walkthroughs. In fact, I've been working on one recently. I say recently. Um, I've been trying to put it up for about two years now. Uh, a Final Fantasy walkthrough. Which is 17 hours long. And I remember when I first finished it. I tried to put it up and YouTube seemed to change their policies about having very long videos on. Because you used to be able to go online and it's like, oh... Voldemort says yee -hee -hee, for 24 hours and I think because there was so much like YouTube poop like that they changed the rules and then I suddenly found out I wasn't allowed to put a video up over 12 hours and then okay it's like okay I'll cut it down into the individual discs I do like to have it all in one section just because of the timestamps at the bottom I thought oh you know if you're trying to figure out where a certain card is I thought that would be easier because obviously there's a different order you can go through Final Fantasy games being uh, quite open world as it were uh, only to find out that it was then so big that every time I tried putting it back into my video editor it crashed so um, <laughs> I do try to make my walkthroughs as quick as possible I do spend a lot of time trying to go through them and make them succinct doesn't always come across that way but I try my best at least anyways we're going to be going into a new area for Leon's playthrough, uh, an area which we weren't able to access with Claire Redfield, where we'll be also being introduced to a new character we've not come across before, unless obviously you're familiar with the later entries. So this is Ada Wong, a character that I often find gets perhaps mixed um, reception from fans is wrong. The overwhelming majority I think like her, but there's a small group that don't because she comes across as a bit too cliche, you know, the femme fatale with the red dress. Uh, she crops up quite a lot in Leon's scenarios. I don't even think she meets a lot of the other characters, but um, she's kind of a staple of Leon and Ada Wong. And for once, Leon actually acting like the rational police officer that he is and trying to have a character not run off in a police station that's infested with zombies and monsters. And let's face it, like, very few survivors, like, the, the risk of mortality is exceedingly high. Don't run off alone. Let me, let me guess. You must be Ben, right? Get up, now. What do you want? I'm trying to sleep here. Is
Is this the guy? Ben? You told the city officials that you knew something about what's been going on, didn't you? What did you tell them? And who the heck are you? I'm trying to find my boyfriend. His name's John. He was working for a branch office of Umbrella, based in Chicago, but he suddenly disappeared six months ago. I heard a rumor that he's here in the city. I don't know anything. And even if I did, why would I want to tell you? Okay, I say we leave him in there. Does anyone know where they put the key to this cell? I have it right here, officer. But I'm not about to leave this cell. Those zombies aren't the only things crawling around out there. What was that? Like I said, I'm not leaving this cell. Get out of here before you lead it right to me. Hey, I'm not going anywhere. I'm the only cop left alive in this building. What? Look, if you want to live, then you're going to have to leave with me. But do you even know how to get out of the city? There's a kennel in the back of the building. Inside the kennel is a manhole. Go through and it'll lead you to the sewer entrance, but it won't be easy. All right, I'm going. Ben actually making a modicum of sense here, choosing to lock himself in a cell because the whole bloody building's infested with zombies and whatnot, and if everyone else has died and you're like the only survivor left, it seems like a pretty decent idea. Uh, that said, it harkens back to me um, having read through the zombie survival guide and World War Z, the book, not the movie, we don't talk about the movie, Concerns that the zombies might come down there, find you, and well, great, now you're stuck in a cell where you either have to pray that someone's going to come and rescue you or you're just going to starve to death with the zombies being on the other side. So I would question putting yourself in that position without some kind of weapon, but maybe he wasn't able to find it. You know, it's not like there was a shotgun just out in the open in the main entrance or anything. So we're going to pick up the manhole from over across where Ben is and with the kennel section you can hear a lot of dogs kind of moving around. Uh, best thing to do is just to run past it as quick as possible and try not to antagonize them. Uh, it's a pretty short distance and you kind of have to go out of your way to get involved with the dogs so it's best just to leave them well be. And moving through here to the back side there's a storage room in here that we're going to make use of. A little bit further down the way is the area where we'll have to put the chess pieces to eventually go into the sewer, although not before we have a little bit of a um, side quest. So we're just going to... I don't think I've introduced myself yet. My name's Leon. I'm with the RPD. It's a dead end. You think we can get upstairs through this shaft? Give me a boost. I'll go and check. How cute. That little girl must have dropped this. I think I'll hold on to it for her. 
So as you might be able to guess from the fact that we've come across Sherry Birkin, this section plays almost identical to the part in scenario, or I should say in Claire's scenario, where you take over Sherry Birkin for a small period. Uh, the only difference is, is that we start from the other end of it. So when we played as Sherry, we were on the other part, which comes up in the elevator, and the room we've just been in is where we would grab the grenade rounds. Um, also, it's significantly easier to go through as Ada, as she has a gun and isn't an eight-year-old. And for some strange reason, there's also zombies you have to deal with rather than dogs. Um, I can only imagine that playing through as Sherry would have been, uh, with zombies instead of dogs, would have made it significantly easier, just because the dogs are so quick, whereas the zombies you can kind of give the slip. Uh, a little bit easier. The only reason I think they've done that, and I could be completely off on this, but this is purely my hypothesis just from what I've observed, is I'm not too certain if the zombies actually have a grab animation to grab Sherry with. Um, I, I could be wrong on that, but I think the only way that the zombies can actually hurt Sherry is by doing their gastric acid attack, where they kind of like regurgitate up some of their stomach acid. Could I could be 100% wrong on that, but I think that might be why. And I think the reason that they're... There's a lot of speculations with this hypothesis, isn't there? But I think the reason why there isn't a grab animation is, one, I'm not sure if they were able to find a way to make it look not clunky and ridiculous like a, a humanoid zombie grabbing onto an eight-year-old and also the idea that an eight-year-old would be able to somehow shake off a fully grown zombie bearing in mind a lot of these zombies are like quite big um in terms of height wise like they're bigger than claire and they're bigger than ada so the idea of an eight-year-old being to shake them off doesn't make a whole lot of sense so they probably put the dogs in so that it doesn't come across as so jarring in fact i think there's only like one zombie you come across while you're controlling sherry at the second time that you come across her and in that instance you can just run past him because he's completely not noticing you he's like staring staring uh, away so you can just like run behind him um so yeah, it, it plays pretty much out the same. Obviously, again, with the continuity I've kind of mentioned before, uh, it doesn't make much sense because when we was playing as Sherry, we never came across Ada because... Just just because I don't actually have a good reason for it. I, I, I'm guessing it's part of... I, I'm guessing the reason for it is if you're playing as Sherry and then you go up to the other side and then Ada drops down, you would have to take control of Sherry to just run off. And considering you're controlling her, you could just, you know, then turn back and just like, what the hell is this lady in red doing? We haven't actually been introduced at this point. So it would kind of like break the kind of immersion that you're going for if that were to occur. Leon, can you hear me? Ada, did you find anything? Right here. Think fast. Here's one more. Hey, I can't reach the ventilation hole. I'm going to have to find another way around. I'll catch up with you later. What? Ada, wait! Got it. Now, when this occurred with Sherry, it made a little bit more sense that she wasn't able to come back because the small girl probably doesn't have the upper body strength to be able to pull her up. But piss off that Ada couldn't jump up there. And also piss off that Leon couldn't just jump up there and call through if he wanted to. Like, he's a police officer, for goodness sake. You have to go through a certain level of physicality and physical training to become a police officer. I know, I know it sounds strange when you have the stereotype of the middle-aged, overweight police officer eating donuts and not doing their job, but you have to be in reasonably good shape to be an officer, and pulling yourself up on that should not be difficult, but game logic. 
So we're just going to run past the kennels again. You can hear them trying to break out. No point interfering with them. I've seen the thing. I know what happens when you start interfering with zombies in a kennel. Sorry, not zombies in a kennel, but mutated or otherwise corrupted dogs in a kennel. Uh, nothing good comes from that. And we don't have a flamethrower to help us out. So we're just going to avoid that. And making our way back, it seems that some of the dogs have managed to escape from the kennel. And the best way to deal with these is just use the pistol. I kind of mentioned it in Resident Evil 1 that the shotgun is grossly inefficient for taking out dogs. Not just because, well, they're not exactly a tough enemy. They get stun locked by handgun shots as it is, so there's no point to use anything of a larger caliber. But also, shotgun damage doesn't seem to translate to the dogs. as Probably not the best way of describing it, but... Basically, you, one shotgun shell, you could kill a zombie. But if you try... Uh, and a reason you can do that is because you can aim for the head. And two shotgun shells will kill a liquor. It's entirely possible that it will take three shells to kill a dog. Even though it only takes two to kill a liquor. And part of that is just because... I'm, I'm not even entirely certain. Just not all the damage translates through. I don't know if there's like some kind of multiplier. In case you're using a shotgun that it does less damage. I'm not sure if it has something to do with the size of the model that you're firing on. I don't actually know how the damage is calculated in this game. And even less for how the shotgun is calculated. But just don't use them for dogs. They're not very effective. Same goes for bowgun. Basically don't use anything but handgun rounds for dogs. And yeah, there's a liquor hiding in the roof of the autopsy, which I did aim up and try to take out, but clearly failed. And if we'll listen closely, yeah, it's not the only one <laughs> that I almost run completely into that one. I'm going to take more than two shots this time. Free to take them out. Eh, not too bad. I just, ah, oh, I just love the liquors. They're, they're just such a cool design. I, I think they're a lot more iconic than the Hunters that you come across in the first game. It's, it's a shame that they're not in more of them. I don't think they appear at all in Resident Evil 3. Instead, they seem to be play, replaced with the Chimeras instead. Uh, there's such a fantastic catalogue of Resident Evil monsters. And just it's a shame that it's almost impossible to find all of them in the same game. Because just some of them are so bloody cool. Lickers, they're almost as iconic as... In fact, they are probably more iconic than a tyrant. Because more players have come across the Lickers than ended up getting to the tyrant. So we're going to make our way through to the weapons storage room. And if when you were playing Scenario A, you didn't pick up either of them, you will have both the equipment side pack as well as the machine gun. And I kind of mentioned in the Scenario A that it's best for whoever gets the machine gun to also get the side pack because it takes up two inventory spaces. So it's to help you carry that whilst also carrying what other items you have. And if, if you do if you do it the way I've done, which is Claire A, Leon B, or if you do it the other way, where it's Leon A or Claire B, I would highly recommend leaving both of those items to the B scenario, just because the B scenario is so much more difficult. And specifically because Mr. X makes an appearance quite often. And I find the machine gun is very effective at dealing with him. The individual, or the bullets, the damage from each individual machine gun bullet is less than that of a handgun. So I find if I try using them on normal zombies, I'm there for ages just trying to like single tap it so I don't waste ammo. Whereas Mr. X is just an absolute unit and you can just kind of unload on him and you don't have to worry about wasting any ammunition. And the way enemies get stunned in this game from taking shots, I think is kind of similar to how it would work in Doom. Um, completely random shout out, but there's a YouTuber called Decino. I'll try and remember to put that in the uh, description that you should check him out. And that is, it's kind of just like a percentage based on when he gets hit, so like a 4 and 8% chance. So hitting him with lots of rounds makes it highly likely you're going to be able to stun him. Gives you a little bit more breathing room. Watchman's Diary, August 11th. I finally had the chance to see blue skies for the first time in ages, but it did little to lift my spirits. I was reprimanded by the chief for neglecting my duties while I was up on the clock tower. 
There's only one thing I still don't understand. The chief seemed to be more concerned about the fact that I was up on the tower rather than that I was neglecting my duties. Why was access to the tower prohibited in the first place anyway? September 5th. I recently talked to the old man who works in the scrapyard out back. His name is Thomas. He's a quiet man and really seems to enjoy chess. He even went so far as to design a special key and lock engraved with chess pieces on them for one of the doors in the disposal yard. We made plans to play chess tomorrow night. I can't help but wonder how good he is. One thing that's been bothering me about him is the way that he's always scratching himself. Does he have some sort of skin disease or is he just rude? September 9th. Thomas was a much better player than I had imagined. I used to think of myself as a fairly decent player, but he did a pretty good job of humbling me. About the only thing I imagine that could match his skills in chess is his appetite. All the guy did was talk about food throughout the entire game. He sounded fairly healthy, but he didn't look quite right. I wonder if he's okay. September 12th. I was supposed to play another game of chess with Thomas, but we had to cancel it because he hasn't been feeling too well. He stopped by to see me, but I told him to go back and rest since he literally looked like the walking dead. He insisted that he was just fine, but I could tell he was really having problems. Come to think of it, I haven't been feeling too good myself lately. So it seems that once someone's been infected with the T-virus, it can take potentially even weeks until you turn. I'm assuming if you've been bitten, then the transformation process is a lot quicker. So we're just going to run into the evidence room, grab our chess piece. And I do like the fact that this kind of um, messes with your expectations. So in Claire's uh, playthrough or scenario A, um, a liquor will crash through that one-way mirror. Doesn't happen on this one, uh, thankfully. Uh, one less... We've had to deal with a lot more bullshit already, so, you know, one less thing to worry about is always always appreciated. So we're going to make our way through here, and the puzzle is exactly the same as with Claire. You're going to use the lighter on the furnace at the far end, which, unlike with Claire, we just have that. Apparently, Leon's a smoker, um, even though you've never seen smoke. And you're going to activate the switches below the statues in the same order, which is middle, right, left, or 12, 13, 11 and that will cause the cog to fall down. Surprise, motherfucker! Now would be a very good time to pull out the machine gun and unload on him, as I've mentioned earlier. So, uh, fortunately for us, Mr. Angst isn't really much of a threat at this point. He kind of just lumbers towards you and is a bit of a bullet sponge and doesn't take too much to uh, take him down. But as you can see, using the machine gun much, much quicker than trying to use the handgun. And although there's quite a lot of room to maneuver at this point, there will be times later on where we have much shorter corridors. So being able to take him out quickly is a good idea. You can just run away from him um, if you so choose. Um, in fact, all, all you, as you saw, all you can pick up from him is some handgun bullets. So if you are strapped for ammunition, just run. Um, it's probably the more cost-efficient way of doing it. Surprise, cockpits! Now, I get the impression the game kind of intended you to run away from the first encounter, as this is one of the shortest distances between him showing up twice in a row. And you can see there's still the hole that he used to first break through. And I, I just love it, the fact that he does it twice in quick succession, so you think you're safe. Like, it's just... Again, messing, subverting one's expectations back when it was actually done well, rather than the crap we come out with nowadays. And yes, fortunately, the second time we take him out, he does actually have some useful ammunition on him in the form of some shotgun shells, as opposed to just handgun ammunition. So yeah, as you can see, the machine gun, very, very effective at dealing with Mr. X, and you will find, for the most part, I saved the machine gun specifically to deal with him. As I mentioned before, I don't know what the pain threshold is. In fact, I'm not even entirely sure what like the stagger chance or how it works in this game is. I'm only going on the assumption that it must in some way be similar to the way it works in Doom. So there's probably a very small percent chance that he gets staggered. But because you're firing so damn many with the machine gun 
and pumping so much damage in him at a short space of time. He usually doesn't move a great deal from whenever you start firing till he's dead. So very, very effective Mr. X killer. Um, it uses roughly 20% of the machine gun ammunition for every encounter you come across to take him out. Now, Mr. X will try to give it to us in the current form that he's in on six separate occasions. So th there's another form he ends up taking on later on, but in the form he is in now where he's wearing the trench coat and he kind of just walks towards you and tries to punch you in the face, you end up coming across him six times. The first time we fought him was back when we only had the handgun right at the start. So we didn't have the machine gun at that point. So there are five times you come across him each time you come across him, you can use about 20% of your machine gun ammunition. Don't have to be a mathematician to figure out why I like using it as such an effective weapon. I, I pretty much just save it exclusively for him. Uh, interestingly enough though, there is a machine gun clip you end up coming across later in the playthrough. Um, if you don't pick up the machine gun because you picked it up in scenario A or you just chose not to pick it up for whatever reason, maybe you're trying to make the game a little bit more difficult for yourself that machine gun clip will be replaced with just a machine gun as it is so you can technically have a machine gun on both playthroughs but considering how easy scenario a is i mean you have so much grenade launcher ammo anyway having the machine gun on top of it is just kind of overkill and i, I would understand if you didn't want to pick it up on this playthrough because you're trying to make it a little bit more difficult for yourself or if you like what I've read online from some of the forums where you thought that using the machine gun was going to stop you from getting a grade A, which it doesn't. It's only if it's an unlimited ammo. Um, I can understand that. But yeah, picking up in scenario A just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, it, you don't need it. It's, it's easy enough. So yeah. So we're just going to make our way through here. And we'll have a crank to open up from the chest here. And there's also a diary round back. Secretary's Diary B June 8th As I was straightening up the chief's room, he burst through the door with a furious look on his face. It's only been two months since I've started working here, but that's the second time I've seen him like this. The last time was when I bumped into that statue, only this time he looked even more agitated than ever. I seriously thought for a moment he was going to hurt me. June 15th I finally discovered what the chief has been hiding all along. If he finds out that I know, my life will be in serious danger. It's getting late already. I'm just going to have to take this one day at a time. The quality of gifts that Mr. X is dropping for us do seem to be increasing every time we come across him. Magnum rounds this time round. Well, they're saying that he does seem to fluctuate a little bit. I know the next time you fight him, he'll drop shotgun shells. And then the time after that, he'll drop magnum shells. So there's a little bit of fluctuation, but at least it's not crappy pistol ammo because we're not really going to be using handgun rounds to be dealing with liquors and the like, are we? Well, we could, but I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, even with the upgraded handgun, it's not, 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 not a situation you want to be forcing yourself into. But anyway, we've managed to pick up the lever and we have the gear that we managed to pick up near the interrogation room which is going to allow us to get the last chest piece so we're kind of wrapping up the first half of this playthrough and we're making our way out of the police station relatively shortly so what we want to do is move over to the library and make our way upstairs to the top part where we'll be able to pick up the final key item from there we're gonna slide down and rendezvous with Ben and Ada uh, Ada actually find quite an interesting character in terms of continuity because I never really played the first one when I was younger. Um, I just I couldn't figure it out. I was actually too scared to play it, <laughs> uh, especially when the dog jumped through the window. I just noped out and turned it off. Um, in the first game, there is a umbrella research scientist called John. Who, um, he writes a, a note saying that he's been infected by the T-virus and he's slowly succumbing to it. And uh, he says that the username for the password is his name, which isn't very secure, having a username John. And then the password is the password of his lover, who is Ada. Again, not very secure password, that's three letters, there's no way they would allow us to do that nowadays. But I think back in the 90s they weren't quite so strict on um, password protection and whatnot. And I just like the fact that they're 
is something there that addresses it. Like, John was a character in the first game, although you didn't meet them. I mean, one of the zombies you killed might have been his reanimated corpse. Just the fact that there's a little bit of continuity between that, I find really, really cool. Um, something I wasn't aware of, in fact, when I played Fu 2 and he was talking about looking for his boyfriend, I thought they just made it up on the spot, but the fact that they're actually referencing the game already, like, only two... I think, I think the Resident, Re Resident Evil franchise is quite self-referential, but the fact they're only already referencing just uh, two games in is pretty cool. Now we're just going to slide down here, which takes us close to the holding cells, which was something we didn't do in the other campaign because it didn't speed us up. Even after all these years, there's something really unsettling about the noise that deformed eye makes. There's some really creepy body horror to it when you start thinking about, like, there, that used to be a person. Yeesh. Ben! Can you still hear me? Come on, answer! Damn! I don't believe this. I almost got the story. <laughs> ben. Uh, <laughs> Bitter irony. The chief of police, a co-conspirator. Get that scum. Make him pay. Hang in there, Ben. Leon. Mail to the Chief. To Mr. Brian Irons, Chief of the Raccoon City Police Department. We have lost the mansion lab facility due to the actions of the renegade operative, Albert Wesker. Fortunately, his interference will have no lasting effects upon our continued virus research. Our only present concern is the presence of the remaining STARS members. Redfield, Valentine, Burton, Chambers, and Vickers. If it comes to light that the stars have any evidence to the activities of our research, dispose of them in such a manner that it would appear to be purely accidental. Continue to monitor their progress and make certain their knowledge does not go public. Annette will continue to be your contact throughout this affair. William Birkin to Mr. Brian Irons, Chief of the Raccoon City Police Department. I have deposited the amount of US $10,000 to the account for your service this time as per agreement. The development of the G virus scheduled to replace the T virus is near completion. Once completed, I am certain that I will be appointed to be a member of the Executive Board for Umbrella Incorporated. It is imperative that we proceed with extreme caution. Redfield and the remaining STARS members are still attempting to uncover information on the project. Continue to monitor their activities and block all attempts to investigate the underground research facilities. William Birkin To Mr. Brian Irons, Chief of the Raccoon City Police Department. We have a problem. I have received information informing me that Umbrella HQ has sent spies to recover my research on the G-Virus. There are an unknown number of agents involved. They must not be allowed to take this project away from me, as it represents my entire life's work. Search the city thoroughly for any suspicious persons. Detain any such individuals by whatever means deemed necessary, and contact me immediately through a net. With these precautions, any possible threat should be eliminated. I will not allow anyone to steal my work on the G-Virus. Not even Umbrella. William Birkin Where are you going, Ada? To the chemical plant. I have a feeling that's where I'll find John. Ada! Wait! Hey! Leon, are you still 
still there? We're leaving. Are you crazy? The streets are still crawling with zombies. It'll be all right, trust me. We found a way to the sewer. Follow us later. Claire! Claire! Wait, wait! Man, why doesn't anyone ever listen to me? <laughs> uh, I love the fact that it's self-aware enough to uh, at least mention the fact that just that there's one police officer in this situation and no one's taking advice from him. Uh, so if you did play Leon Scenario A, uh, Ben at that point will end up having the same fate as Chief Irons, where he will be infected by William Birkin as opposed to just outright killed. So whoever you play in Scenario A, you end up having to fight the offspring or like the, the parasite that comes out of William infecting someone. Whereas when you play Scenario B, you end up fighting his first initial form. So yeah, Ada's run off to the chemical plant because she thinks that John might be there. Obviously, if you've played the first game, then we're aware that John is very much dead. But Ada isn't aware of this. Um, as far as she knows, she's you know around somewhere. So it makes sense that she's still looking for him. So we're going to move back into the room where we put the previous chess pieces in. And I'm going to pull our magnum out because we are going to come across William Birkin himself. So this is the first one. We've already had to fight his later forms in Claire's scenario A. Um, he's not really too tough here. I think the biggest problem when fighting him is just how enclosed this environment is. So there's not a huge amount of space to actually get some distance on him. Which is why we're just going to whack out the magnum here and just try and put him down as quick as we can. He doesn't actually take all that much damage um, if you hit him with like the big rounds, like, well, the magnum. And he's pretty slow, so yeah, we're just going to move over to the, the center. And as you see, after each shot, I'm making sure I press the L1 button to realign so we're not wasting anything. And he's down. Just make sure you don't uh, get too close to him when he's in his death throw so you don't get whacked by his iron bar. And he's going to very conveniently walk to the side and make a dramatic exit. Bye bye, William. We'll see. We'll see him again, in, you know, relatively soon. So he's not gone for now. So he's going to put the last two chess pieces in and make our way to the second portion of the game. What was that all about? Running off like that was reckless and stupid. Those zombies are everywhere, not to mention that thing that got Ben. I was there, Leon, I know. Look, Ada, as an officer, it's my job to look out for you. But we're not going to get through this alive if we don't work together, okay? All right, we'll do this your way for now. One thing I find quite remarkable for a game that came out in 98 is that there's a few sections here and with Claire when Sherry was following us where the character will um, be tailing us and for the most part they're fine, like they don't get caught in anything or there aren't any problems. I'm not sure if that's because they're, you know, there's not too many situations where it occurs but I mean you had Dai Katana coming out not too long after this which was just a fucking nightmare for having companions alongside. So as we go in here, there is a diary which I'm going to start reading in a second, probably because a cutscene's coming up. Uh, if we move these lockers out of the way and go downstairs, uh, use the lighter on a few of the lamps down here, and that will give us vision to pick up a few goodies. There's some shotgun shells and some magnum rounds. Don't need them, but it helps for the lab section, which gets dicey later. Sewer manager facts. Use a list of the connecting facility. On the first and third Wednesdays of the month, Angelica Margaret, Chief of Maintenance, will make use of the facilities. Be sure to reduce the moisture levels in the facility by activating the fan, as the equipment she will be using is susceptible to the effects of water vapours. On the 28th of every month, the chemical transporter Don Wheeler will use the facility. The chemicals he will be transporting are extremely volatile. Extreme caution should be observed throughout their transport. On the 6th and 16th of every month, Police Chief Brian Irons will visit the facility 
to attend the regular meetings that take place in the lab. On the fourth Friday of every other month, William Birkin will use the facility to conduct a training seminar for the Chicago branch of Umbrella Incorporated. As the probability of an attack upon Dr. Birkin will be high, take every measure conceivable to guard his life. You will be informed of all other potential visitors and times they will arrive as needed. Guide these individuals to their destination safely. We expect nothing but the best from you. Charles Coleman, Secretary Chief, Umbrella Headquarters. That woman was... I have to talk to her. Yeah, no problem, Ava. Not like I just took a fucking bullet for you. Just just let me bleed out on the floor. That's that's fine. Um, I'm not quite sure how it knocked Leon out. Maybe he kind of reacted as he got shot and that made him bonk his head on the way down. But Ada, you're kind of a bitch. Like, I could be bleeding out, but you haven't even checked to see if, like... How bad the wound is, if, I, if it's hit a major artery, you haven't checked shit. It's going to run off and go find a net. I mean, obviously we're going to be fine because we're the, the main character. It was uh, twas merely a flesh wound, but um, I think that kind of shows that Ada, I mean, she has a soft spot to her, but her priorities are definitely different. Chicago who came to assist the T-Virus research used his girlfriend's name as his password. Ada and John, I believe. How did you know? Who are you? Annette Birkin. My husband is the man responsible for the creation of the T-Virus. William Birkin. What? John's dead. He became one of those zombies. My condolences. And although I regret this... You will be joining him shortly. I won't let anyone take the G-Virus away from me. G-Virus? It's capable of creating the ultimate bioweapon. Its potential is even greater than that of the T-Virus. Then that must mean the creature in the police department is... Precisely... My husband, William. And it's all Umbrella's fault. None of this would have happened if they hadn't tried to steal his research away from him. Where did you get that pendant? It looks exactly like the one I gave Sherry. She dropped it. I've been holding on to it for her. Liar! Give it back to me! <laughs> <laughs> Too bad. Remember kids, if anyone points a gun at you, just get them monologuing and wait for the point of opportunity where you can clock them and throw them down a sewer shaft works every time. So after that little conversation, she's finally learned to look at the locker and realize that the G-Virus is inside it. Ada? So if you've got to this point and you don't have the valve handle in your inventory, it might be an idea to go back up the elevator and grab it because we're going to be needing it 
to get across a bridge that can uh, turn around later on and you don't want to be doing all the unnecessary backtracking. Not that this area is too dangerous, there's a lot of these giant tarantulas but I don't think I actually end up shooting at a single tarantula in either playthrough in Resident Evil 2. They kind of chew the scenery and are just in the background, but they aren't ever really in a position where they're going to threaten you. So it's much better just to run past them so you don't have to waste any ammunition. One thing I quite like about this sewer area is the ability for it to show some environmental storytelling. And I'm going to get all pretentious game dev on you with this one. I kind of mentioned it a little bit in some of the areas in the police station in, the, uh, in Claire's playthrough. But the sewer section, if you look on the walls, there will be splatters of blood and bullet holes from where the operatives for, or the SWAT team from Umbrella... I, would you call it a SWAT team? I suppose it would be a private mil uh, military, wouldn't it? But there's bullet wounds and stuff from where they ended up fighting William when he first transformed. And it, it's just like a nice little detail that this is where all of that shit took place. So go across the bridge and make sure you turn it again. Otherwise, you have to do some more backtracking. So use the uh, use the valve on either side to make sure you don't have to come back here. Because it's just, it's just, there's quite a few areas you have to go through. And it's just a complete faff if you've got to do any backtracking. Uh, fortunately, we don't have a giant alligator to fight this time, unlike with the previous scenario. That said, it wasn't really much of a boss fight. It takes like a single handgun round to take out, but it's one thing we don't have to worry about. And we're just going to make our way round, making our way downtown. Sorry. Um, yeah, we're just going to make our way through and we're going to rendezvous with Ada and be like, right, bitch, I've had a bullet wound here. Do you want to, you know, kind of help me? I did take the shot for you. A little bit rude. I'm just saying. Well, it's nice that she's finally put a bandage over the gaping bullet hole in her chest. But given the fact this came out in 98, I have to assume that she understands, you know, germ theory. And considering we've just walked through an entire sewer section with an open wound, um, I mean, Leon's pretty fucking dead at this point unless he has, like, a shit ton of antibiotics as soon as he gets out of Raccoon City. Sewer Manager's Diary. June 28th. It's been a while, but I saw Don today and we talked after completing our work. He told me he had been sick in bed until yesterday. It really doesn't come as much of a surprise, given how long he's been working here. He was sweating like a horse, and kept scratching his body while we were talking. I asked if he was hot, but he just looked at me funny. What's wrong with him anyway? July 7th. Chief Irons has been visiting the lab quite often lately. I don't know what he's doing over there, but he always looks grim. The expression on his face has been even more unsettling than usual. My guess is that it's because of Dr. Birkin's impossible requests. The chief has my sympathies though. After all he's done for the town, he doesn't deserve this. July 21st. I rarely drink because I'm on the graveyard shift, but I don't suppose I have much to complain about since this is how I make my living. August 16th. Chief Irons came in late today, looking grimmer than his usual self. I tried to joke with him, to cheer him up, but he wasn't amused. He pulled his gun and threatened to shoot me. I was able to calm him down, but that guy must have some serious problems. He knows he can't enter the lab without my help and my medal. This is what it means for the chief to serve and protect? August 21st. William informed me that the police and media have begun their investigation on Umbrella's affair. 
He said that the investigation will be citywide and that there is a possibility they'll even search through the sewers. He asked me to suspend all umbrella sewer facility operations until the investigation has concluded. The sewer will still be used for passage, but he stressed that I have to be extremely cautious and that I'd lose my job if anyone finds out about this operation. So by placing both of the medals we've picked up in the device there, that stops the waterfall from falling into the sewers and the floor drains relatively quickly. Um, in terms of gameplay, like the sewer draining and so you can run around on the floor doesn't make any difference, mostly because we don't actually go through that area again. I think it's more just for the aesthetic so you can see that, you know, there's no water coming in, it's drained through so we can move onwards. So we're going to move down to the area which Ada seems to have an inkling was about. You can only assume that comes from the territory of her being some kind of uh, a spy against Umbrella. Which also does beg the question why she's going around telling Annette that her name is Ada and telling everyone actually for that matter that her name's Ada. You'd think she'd use some kind of alias unless Ada is her alias and her real name is something we don't know. But then everyone knows her as Ada including her boyfriend who works for Umbrella so it kind of defeats the purpose. Like the whole point of having false identities is that people don't know you're a spy. If everyone knows you as Ada Wong the spy, but they don't know your real name, then your pseudonym is in no way, shape or form helping you. But who am I to question the expertise of the sexy half Asian lady? Uh, she's not going to be too helpful on this little encounter. So William Birkin isn't too happy about us using his tram line and will keep trying to slash downwards. Uh, you, all you have to do is just move out the way whenever you see debris falling, quite similar to the plant fight in the first game. And there's no point to waste expensive ammunition for like the magnum or shotgun just use the machine gun because it's based on the amount of times you hit him not the damage you inflict and with that the tram is moving again and we've pretty much completed that set piece um ada doesn't help you although she does fire a few shots in the cutscene at the end um i'm not entirely sure certain why i always thought maybe the reason was is that they're trying to show you that this is a set piece you have to do, that Ada's not going to help you with it. Um, why that's the case, I'm not entirely certain, because for a while I thought, oh, maybe they couldn't get Ada to actually attack, but in the section we're about to go through um, coming up, she absolutely will take zombies out. Like, she will shoot at them, no problem. So I can only assume it's the fact that Ada kind of sticks near you, and... She will fire her gun, but she probably didn't have as advanced enough AI at 98 to be able to move around to avoid getting hit by the attacks. And maybe, you know, they did some playtests and they found it just frustrating for her to be an element in that fight. So they just decided to get rid of her entirely. So she gets knocked out at the start and then there's a cutscene towards the end where she's uh, playing her role to do a little bit of help, but doesn't actually help in the fight. Now for this section, it's not at all difficult. So as I mentioned, unlike with Sherry Birkin in Claire Redfield scenario, Ada will actively help us. Not massively, it's more a case that if a zombie... Oh, we oh, missed that one. Fired a little bit prematurely. Um, yeah, if a zombie gets close, she will fire at it. And she fires quite rapidly as well, so she's... Quite good if you miss a shot to at least help a little bit out, but she's not going to be clearing much out on her own. Now with the shotgun parts we've just picked up from the corpse, we want to treat them exactly the same way as the handgun parts in that there's no reason to be combining them just yet because we still got a couple of shells left. What we want to do is use all the shells up and then combine them and that way we basically get a, a refill, a free refill on a clip. Not, not even just a refill, um, once the shotgun's upgraded it actually carries more ammunition. So we get two extra shots out of it and yeah, five shots used up and now it's upgraded and can hold seven. Now once the shotgun's upgraded, you can't aim up anymore, but you don't need to. As we, <laughs> as we just saw there, uh, a single shotgun round fired at chest height blew off his head and his torso like the shotgun is absolutely devastating at this point we finally arrived there must be something hidden here
So Ada's going to depart from our company to presumably split up and look for clues. Um, I'm guessing she's looking at something with the computer to try and see what's going on, which even though it's, it's just flashing, I don't think there's anything of value there, but it's basically just the game saying that we're going to carry on by ourselves for a little bit. So the upgraded shotgun does do a lot of damage, but the thing to remember with both the upgraded shotgun and the upgraded magnum we get later on is unlike the pistol, um, it actually slows down our rate of fire. We get so much recoil from each shot that we need a little bit of time after each one to actually be able to recover. So something to take into account, especially later on when you're fighting some of the bosses where even the upgraded weapons won't be enough to stun lock them you need to take into account the fact that there's a very long recoil animation and it's something you have to kind of work around when you're fighting the bosses forward. So one thing that the game does actually take into account in terms of continuity is at this section the train line has already been taken down by Claire and Sherry Birkin so it kind of makes sense that it's not here. So instead we have to go into the maintenance server and Yes, of course, there's a there's a very small walkway where which you can't run past, so of course Mr. X would choose this time to uh, make his appearance. And I, <laughs> I do I do quite like that, the way you, you first see him on the monitor before you see him. It's a good little bit of menacing as he just kind of walks forward. But now be careful, because as you can see, this section there isn't much room to work with. And that's exactly why he ambushes you here. Because this is one of the later times you fight him. So it expects you to have some decent weapons at this point and know how to deal with them. So just like before, just pull up the machine gun and just blast him. And only shotgun shells this time. We got we got magnum rounds last time. Um, he's had to budget a little bit, it seems. And only 18% of the machine gun used up for that particular fight. So, you know, we, we're doing good. We're doing good. I, I'm not sure if it's just the fact that there's a little bit of variation between how much damage it takes or if they made him ever so slightly weaker because they realized you had so little room to maneuver in. But one way or the other, he is dealt with. So let's go back and see our lady in red. Now, much like with Claire scenario, as we take the tram line down, we're going to have a slight boss encounter say slight boss encounter, it is a boss encounter. So use this opportunity to swap out the items that you need to help you through it. It's not a particularly tough fight. You're going to be fighting William Birkin in his third form, which is actually the same form that you fought in the scenario A at the last the last fight you had with him before he transforms into the dog-like version. So is is not too difficult to be honest. He just does a lot of damage if you get close, and you shouldn't be that stupid. Come on, let's go. He is admittedly a little bit tougher than when we had to fight him as Claire. As you imagine, he's a slightly higher form of mutation, so you expect him to be a bit stronger. With Claire, you could kind of just get away with the way that he jumps down, just getting your distance on him and just plugging him away. Whereas I find with this fight, you do need to be able to run past him, so it is a little bit sketchier. Um, not too much more difficult, but you need to have your wits about you a tiny bit more. I'm going to go ahead and assume that Leon is not medically trained because I don't think a concussion is something you just snap out of. Uh, Ada Wong gets taken out at the start of this fight, much like the previous one, but this time there are actually consequences to that, like she is injured story-wise. So we're going to have to face William Birkin's third form all on our lonesome.
Now, the biggest difference between this fight and when you had to fight him as Claire in the same area is rather than just walk towards you slowly, which he does do, admittedly, um, he can also jump up on the roof of the cart, just like that, and he'll use that to try and cut you off, essentially. So whenever you see him jump up, start moving back. And uh, he does cut quite the intimidating presence with his uh, outstretched claws, but it's really just a case of staying away from him. Fortunately, he doesn't have any kind of like quick dash attack. The only way he has to cut you off is to jump up and then jump back down. And then you'll just keep walking towards you. So just do your best to keep your distance. Um, I do find the Magnum has a little bit more of a um, recoil than the grenade launcher for some reason. But yeah, take a few times. Once you start firing at him and there's no blood splurting out, that's when you know his health's gone. And rather than fall apart like he did in the previous fights, he will just uh, ju jump away and you'll carry on downwards. So not, not, not a too difficult boss fight. Just uh, shoot him a few times and once he's done, go back to see Ada. At this point, the tram will stop working, forcing you to get out at a different section. So there's some new areas to explore now. Welcome back. Oh. Hey, take it easy. We're inside Umbrella's secret lab. I'll go find something to treat that wound, so just rest here in the meantime. But I'll only slow you down with these injuries. Go. Save yourself. Is it just me, or does everybody always ignore what I say? I told you, it's my job to look after you. But you'll be in danger if you stay with me. I know I've only known you for a short period of time, but I really enjoy being with you. I... I know I'm not capable of caring about anyone, but I don't want to lose you. We're leaving this place together. Wait here for me. I'll be right back. See, what Leon says actually kind of makes sense at that point. Just like, does no one listen to what I have to say? And then Ada's dialogue talking about losing someone and not caring. It does come across as a little bit off almost like the first Resident Evil and I can only imagine that's kind of like a, a translation issue as I've mentioned before. Leon's dialogue actually for the most part is pretty good for Resident Evil 2. Like he actually makes sense and he tells people like why does no one fucking listen to me? So yeah, the tram line goes down and Ada's safe for the time being. We don't have to worry about babysitting her. Instead, we have a new area to uh, look through, which is a little bit exciting, isn't it? I think this is um, the first major new area actually in this scenario. Obviously, a lot of what we've seen so far, I mean, we've, we've seen a couple of new sections, like especially near the beginning. But it's mostly just, you know, the police station or the sewers just in a slightly different order. Whereas this is all a brand new area that we can enjoy. And I say enjoy, most of this section is kind of just busy work, to be honest. There's a few puzzles, there's not too many enemies. It's just navigating the area and getting through to the next section, really. Investigation report on P Epsilon gas. This report demands immediate attention. The P Epsilon gas has been proven capable of incapacitating all known BOWs, bioorganic weapons. As such, it has been designated for emergency usage in the event of a BOW escape. Reports based on data collected during prior incidents indicate the potential for negative side effects. The P epsilon gas has proven to weaken the BOW cellular functions. However, prolonged or repeated exposures will result in the creation of adaptive antibodies in the agent. Furthermore, 
Some species have been observed to absorb the P-epsilon gas as a source of nutrition and use the toxins extracted against anything perceived as a threat. Use of P-epsilon gas should be severely limited to extreme cases only. We strongly request the authority to re-evaluate the P-epsilon gas deployment system. We would like this re-evaluation to take place immediately. Second R&D room, security team. Now that was quite a cool feature that I, I genuinely didn't know could happen until I was going through this walkthrough. So sometimes if you fire your gun directly as if you're pointing towards the camera, you'll get like these little shatters on the glass as if like there's been bullets going through the um, like the screen that you're watching. I didn't even know that was a thing until I took those lookers out at that point. It's like, oh crap, what the fuck? Uh, you don't get those little little tidbits in anymore, do you? Oh god, the god, I sound like such a boomer, don't I? Oh, you don't, they don't make games like they used to. I mean, I'm sure they would have that same kind of interaction with a more modern game. It just probably would be behind some kind of DLC play, paywall. Like the Total War games, like you have to pay £2 just to have the blood included. It's like, you, 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 you what? And, and then it's always never quite right. You either play it normally and there's no blood, which makes no sense when you have armies going to fight and cut each other to pieces. It's all like PG-13. Or you have the blood pack where it splurts out and splatters on the screen. It's just like this, just so over the top now and looks kind of comically bad. They can't get the, they can't get it quite right anymore. And uh, look at that, I was lying earlier. <laughs> you can aim the gun up still. I. Didn't think you could because of the way it's held, but I'm misremembering it, and I'm just lying to you again. So this section we've come to, well, I said that there's not, and that's one of the reasons why even with the upgraded shotgun you kind of want to. There's so much impact with the shotgun that you can completely blow the torso off and then they start crawling towards you. Which is really cool, but it does mean you waste more ammunition because it's going to require a second shot to take them out, so... As Thanos said, you should aim for the head. So that area we never ended up going back to in Claire's scenario, which is the just outside the security room where Sherry is. But if we had gone back there at some point when we're going around this kind of area, the underground umbrella lab, the zombies that were roaming out there would have been there. It's just there was no reason to go back, so we never got to see them. Um, I'm not sure why the zombies in the lab are naked. Um, there's just a, a different model they use for this section, which seems to be what they use in a lot of it. I know in the first one, there's a similar kind of zombie. When you go towards the end, there's like half naked ones rather than the ones wearing lab coats. And I, I get the assumption that those are like the test subjects they were like using them on. I'm not sure entirely. Although saying that, and I'm going to gush about World War Z again, although more specifically the zombie survival guide, because it's a really good book and if you haven't read it, you should read it. Um, one thing they mention in there is that if the zombie virus as we see it was, you know, like a virus, then it would alter humans as opposed to reanimating them. Uh, you know, that, that gets a bit more kind of magical in a sense. I mean, you can try and dress it up as being a bit science fiction but like actually bringing someone back to life is getting a bit getting a bit on there into like Frankenstein territory but a big part he mentioned in the book or in the zombie survival guy I should say is there's assumption because of you know classic horror movies like Night of the Living Dead and whatnot that if you were to come across a zombie outbreak it would just be like a cross section of everyday society you know you'd have guys in business suits you'd have women wearing dresses it would just look like normal everyday society but undead and in reality it probably wouldn't be like that it's especially during the initial stages of an outbreak as it were because i mean okay try to think of Shaun of the dead for instance um pete gets bitten in that and he comes home he's like oh this absolute nut job bit me and then what does he do he goes and showers he goes to bed or he goes to a hospital and then he reanimates and the middle of the night so the zombies you'd come across you would expect them either to be naked or wearing like hospital gowns or pajamas so there should be more naked zombies is what i'm saying here i'm advocating for nudity in my resident evil games 
I mean, what's, what would be more terrifying than a zombie slowly walking towards you is Dangle just flapping around. Like, that's like a power move. That is sheer intimidation there. You know, there's a registration here. So it should say that the username is, is guest, which we used in the previous one. And I'll read this. Laboratory security manual. Security measures in case of an emergency. In the instance of an uncontainable biohazardous breakout, all security measures will be directed toward the underground transport facility. In the instance that any abnormalities are detected among cargo in transit, all materials will automatically be transported from the loading zone to the designated high-speed train, at which point all materials will be isolated and disposed of immediately. In the instance of a Class 1 emergency, the entire train will be purged and disposed of without delay. In the instance that the lab itself becomes contaminated, the northernmost route currently used to transport materials to and from the facility will be designated as the emergency escape route. This route will secure passage to the relay point outside the city limits. Disclosure about any information regarding research conducted here or the existence of this facility is strictly prohibited. Since it is a top priority to keep all research classified, Escape access may be denied under certain extenuating circumstances. So we have the flamethrower and I'm genuinely under the impression that the flamethrower was designed to be used against the plants. However, it absolutely sucks in that role. As you're seeing right now, they shoot out this kind of um, acidic, like digestive kind of enzyme stuff. So the best way to, if you're going to try and use the flamethrower is to try and get them on a corner like this. Otherwise, they're going to outrange you. Um, you may have noticed going through here that a lot of the liquors are of the upgraded variety. And that's just that's just how it is. When you get to the lab, there's a lot of upgraded liquors that's going to take more shots to take down. We can't do anything about that. But fortunately, because we didn't activate the UMB gas in Claire's scenario A, the plants were facing are the same plants. Had we had done that, they would be an upgraded version. And they're not really the biggest threat, to be fair. You don't come across too many of them. A lot of the times you can kind of just run past them. But, you know, why make it hard for yourself when there's no need to? So, go going through here, be careful. Because there's, as you can see, a lot of jump scares. A lot of liquors will just instantly drop down. And even knowing that's the case, there's a few that completely catch me off guard. They, they do it quite a lot. Um, I think jump scares in games are probably a little bit more forgiving than a jump scare in a movie because there's, there's a reason for the jump scare to be there. They're trying to catch you off guard so that maybe you... F <laughs> and I, I know this because when I was young, I was playing... Uh, I used to play... Well, I'd say I used to play. I used to watch my mum attempt to play some of the horror games and then jump scare will happen and she will freak out drop the controller and then get killed because she's like skidded it under the uh, under the sofa so there's a bit more of a reason to have them in in horror games i find there's actually a, a gameplay element because you're being ambushed whereas when you have jump scares in horror movies they're usually just really cheap um I think the only, there's the, there's a few exceptions, like in the classic Alien, there's one where Dallas turns around and the alien's just in the face. And I think, you know, that's a jump scare done right, because there's a reason for it existing. But when you have, like, the really cheap ones, and you know what I'm talking about, if you've ever seen, like, any B-grade horror movies, where a girl's just, like, sitting in the car, and then her friend will just jump up and bang on it, and then there'll be a musical cue going, ba because it's trying to scare you, and it's like, there's nothing to be scared of, it's just her friend. And it's just like, what the fuck are you doing? Are you just trying to piss me off? Right? Anyways, we're using the weapon key that we got from lighting the flare up, we have some weapon parts for the Magnum. Unlike with Claire, where there was just some grenade rounds, there's actually a weapon part here, which technically is ammunition in and of itself. Now, as I said before, the flamethrower is kind of crap, um, so we're just going to use it to take out these zombies just to save more valuable ammunition. I mean, for the most part, if you're smart with your ammo usage, you don't really struggle all that much. But, and yeah, we can see we're already out. It's not a very good weapon. It's kind of like the electro stun prod gun from Claire Scenario. It's kind of shit. So you just want to use it to on like weak zombies so you can save more valuable ammunition for the things that are actually a threat. And I want to show it off as well. It, it seems kind of wrong to do a 
a walkthrough and not show off all the aspects to it. I mean, that said, I probably could have done a, a better job of um, getting all of the different photos to show off all the different files, but there's wikis for it. And to be fair, getting one of the photos, which is just a really creepy image of Rebecca Chambers, and it's like her face photoshopped over a half-naked person at the beach, uh, you have to interact with Albert Wesker's desk 50 times, and then after the 50th time, it will allow you to pick it up. So it's a secret that's, like, hidden. And I, I, I've told you how to get it now. If you really are interested in going to check it out, that's what you can do. But I'd much rather just, you know, go look up on the wiki and you can see what it is and see how it's just not worth it. I, I, it's a really weird Easter egg and kind of creepy, to be honest. Um, it's... Eh. I'm guessing that was the equivalent of sexual tantalization at 1998, was a photoshopped face onto a really pixelated picture, but uh, there you go. So, moving in here, you're going to clear out the uh, maggots. I probably should have saved a little bit of flamethrower fuel rather than wasting shotgun rounds, but we'll go for it. And much like with Claire, you can shoot with a shotgun, shoot with a grenade, shoot with whatever. It doesn't destroy the keyboard because physics works in a strange way in the Resident Evil universe. So just type in guest. There's uh, no password because despite the fact that Umbrella is conducting research that is, let's face it, <laughs> breaking all the ethical guidelines and is an affront to humanity uh, they're not going to put a secure password on it just just type in guest and you can see all of the horrible fucking experiments they've been running on humans umbrella is like up there with wayland yutani with the kind of like evil corporation that is just evil for the sake of being evil like the motivations they have in both cases is like creating a biological weapon wayland yutani obviously wants to get the alien xenomorph for the bioweapons division and then umbrella wants to create bioweapons i mean there's a bit more of a backstory in the fact that a lot of the research initially i believe was conducted by a character called oswald e spencer and i think that you know there was some idea about immortality that seems to often be the case with zombie movies um, i know in house of the dead that's pretty much how um that happened by dr curian yeah that that, that liquor right there is a motherfucker <laughs> catches me off guard every time but yeah in, in um house of the dead dr curian was doing a research because i think his uh his son was like with a terminal illness and he was trying to find a way to basically make him live past life. And I think there's there's something similar going on here. And I suppose you could say the similar with uh, Alien Covenant in that they were trying to find new life forms to help them gain immortality. Which, eh, I mean, Alien Covenant, the less said about that the better. Like, I hate when they red corner. Even more depressing when it's done by the person who originally made the thing, and then he comes back to the thing only to fuck the thing up. Um, George Romero kind of did a similar um, problem with it. It was... I, I can't remember the exact date. It was around 2000. He made another, like, Dawn of the Dead or Land of the Dead. I always get them mixed up in my head. I do apologize. And in a lot of his earlier movies, they like praised him. It's like, oh, you know, there being zombies in a mall is like talking about consumerism and the problems of society. And I think a lot of the stuff that he did, he kind of did as an accident. And then people came to it and gave it more credit that it was due. And so he was given all of that information. And then when he tried to make another movie, it's just so on the nose, it's crap. And that's what happens when you praise someone too much, that goes to their head, I think. Anyway, this is a new area we're gonna come with. So because we've registered ourselves, we can go through here. And if you recall on scenario A, we weren't able to get through because you need two passcodes for it. So the only way we can enter this room is if when you're playing as Claire, you register your fingerprints. If you don't, then you come to this section and you can't do anything. So make sure you do that and come in here to uh, to grab the goodies in here. And say that I'm getting accosted by liquors at the moment. Um, kind of interesting. If you listen closely, in fact, actually, I'm not going to shut up. You can go to the walkthrough if you want to listen to it. Um, the music that plays in here, I'm pretty sure, doesn't play anywhere else in the game. It's completely set to just this one room. And there's not a huge amount in here other than some machine gun bullets, which gives us another fill of the machine gun and as I mentioned previously if you didn't pick up the machine gun for this playthrough 
uh, the, the dead body will instead have machine gun on it. So you only get the machine gun bullets if you already have a machine gun. Makes sense. Make sure that you do obviously register the fingerprints as Claire. It's quite easy to move across that section and forget to do it in scenario A because you don't get any benefit. It's only when you get to the second scenario that you see the results of it. And that was a mistake I made when I first tried making these walkthroughs is that I came to this section with Leon scenario B, uh, tried getting in, registered my fingerprints and I couldn't get in. And I was like, hang on, why isn't this working? There are two registered users. I had to register Claire as a guest to be able to get through and put her fingerprints in. But because I didn't activate that specific switch, couldn't get in, which meant I had to redo the whole walkthrough because of one little mistake, which made my hair go gray and then I pulled it out. So don't make that mistake if you're playing for yourself. You, you murdered my husband. I know what you're looking for. You came for the G-Virus, didn't you? You'll never take it from me. This is my husband's legacy. Now, where's that spy you were working with earlier? You know who I'm talking about. What? You really don't know anything, do you? <laughs> You're so gullible. She's one of the operatives sent here by the agency. And why she came here is to obtain the G-Virus. That's a lie. No, it's the truth. I discovered this when I did a background check on her. She specifically got close to John and became his girlfriend to get information about her world. That can't be. I know her. Ada wouldn't do something like that. If you don't want to believe it, I don't really care. You're about to die anyway. So in hindsight, seeing as I've picked up the machine gun ammunition, I probably should have gone and got the machine gun to reload it for. Because you're about to see, whilst you can use magnums and shotguns to take this guy out, as you're saying, with the machine gun, because you're firing so constantly, you pretty much get, um, get him like stuck in one position. Whereas even something like a magnum doesn't have a high enough rate of fire to really stop him. Although that said, once you include the extra magnum parts and give him a shot... They do absolutely devastating amounts of damage. As you would expect, the Magnum is one of the most powerful weapons in Resident Evil games, and we've just made it stronger. So it is very, very powerful. Uh, I think the thing to remember, and I mentioned this with the shotgun as well, the Magnum, when you've upgraded it, has tremendous recoil. The animation is really, really long for recovery, which in most situations isn't too much of an issue because you've killed whatever you're aiming at. That isn't the case, however, for um, one of the final fights we'll come across later. And you'll notice that I'm very picky. When we, well, I'll, I'll cover it a bit more when we get to it, but I'm very picky with my shots because the recoil animation is so large and the boss that you fight is so quick that you have to get into the absolute perfect position to be able to fire and then move without immediately getting hit. So if you're trying to do a no hit run, it might actually be worth it not to upgrade the Magnum just so you have a shorter reload or recoil animation, not reload animation, a shorter recovery time behind each shot. Uh, but if if you don't care about that, then an upgraded Magnum is stupid strong, as you would kind of expect. Um, it does, it basically does as much damage as you expect from like a 50 caliber uh, Beretta, just like punctured through buildings. So there's a, there's a certain satisfaction when you hit something with it. But bringing back to the conversation that we've just had with Annette Birkin, I do... <laughs> I do find it quite amusing. I mean, for the most part, Leon's dialogue has been really, relatively intelligent, being like, why does no one listen to me? It's like very self-aware that he's in a horror movie or a horror game that's based on, you know, B-grade horror movies. But we've just heard him say, oh, and Ada wouldn't do that. I know her. Leon, I know you're simping for her because, you know, Asian's red dress, who wouldn't? But you've had less than 10 minutes of conversation with her. 
you don't know shit about her any more than someone who subscribes to an e-girl. <laughs> Leon, please, escape. No. We're a team. I can't just leave you behind. I'm just a woman who fell in love with you. Nothing more. Ada. No. Ada! The self destruct sequence has been activated. Repeat. The self destruct sequence has been activated. This sequence may not be aborted. All employees proceed to the emergency car at the bottom platform. I will always remember you. Goodbye. Is that you? Where are you? I can see you on the monitor. But never mind that right now. Leon, you have to go back and get Sherry for me. I left her in the security office. Please, you must save her. Wait a second. What are you gonna do? Where are you going? I still have a few loose ends to take care of. I'm counting on you. Hello? Claire, are you there? Claire! Office? Now, I don't think it's too much of a spoiler for me to say that Ada doesn't actually die there. And I, I would say it's not a spoiler because she appears in a whole bunch of games after the fact, including Resident Evil 4, which is, you know, set several years after this. So, canonically speaking, Ada doesn't die in this version. And I think it's also partly why the canonical version is... Claire A, Leon B, because in Leon B, like, she fights the tyrant and she ends up, like, bleeding out there, but presumably, well, she doesn't die, she manages to get up and away, whereas in Scenario A, she ends up falling off, a, like, a, a, a bridge into a chasm, and, and one's more believable than the other. In fact, the, the, the fact that she just died there, the only thing that makes it a tad unbelievable is the sheer amount of blood that she seems to have lost. So for her to be able to somehow get out of that situation, being as weak as she was, seems a bit on the nose, but then you, you could probably just, you know, say because of the, the graphical um, limitations at the time that that's why, you know, whenever an, an enemy dies, there's always the pool of blood and they just had to go with that, which I know I'm kind of giving it perhaps a little bit too much credit, but that that's how I, in my head, my head canon, I think of it as. Although that said, it would kind of depend on where the bleeding was. I know if you suffer from like a 
if you're bleeding profusely from like a, a injury to the stomach, you can last days. So, you know, there is that element to it. But a lot of the conversation they had towards the end is really cheesy. And I, I, again, I've praised a lot of what Leon said up until the final sections. But I always kind of assumed that the reason it's so, you know, cliche is like, oh, they think Ada's dying and they have a kiss. It's, it's very cliche. Was 198, it probably wasn't as cliche as it is now, whereas we're a lot more aware of these kinds of tropes. But also because a big part of Ada's character is the fact that she is very manipulative. So I think canonically speaking, she is able to successfully extract some of the T-virus research and whatnot and able to get out of here. So she probably had some of the materials on her and faked the death to Leon so that she could escape with the materials that she needed because her mission was always to come here to get them. And as, as we'll see even later on in this game, we know that she survived. So I'm guessing that was always meant to be the assumption. Just rest here. Claire should be back soon. As opposed to, for instance, Wesker's appearance in the first game, where I, I'm pretty certain they just... Well, I don't think there was an intending a franchise at that point. I'm, I'm sure they were hoping there would be, but... You know, you, you should never go into creating something assuming it's going to be successful to get a sequel. You just have to make a standalone good game and hope that it is. And I always got the assumption that Wesker's death in the first one, which then becomes the fact that he planned it all along and that's how he ends up getting powers because he's injected himself with some special kind of virus from uh, Umbrella and then he ends up basically having Matrix powers for the rest of the game pit series. I'm pretty sure that was kind of redconned in. Like in the first game, I'm pretty sure it was just meant to be the idea that he was, you know, arrogant and got his comeuppance. And then they kind of redconned it in that it's all part of his grand plan. Whereas Ada surviving this, I think they always kind of intended her to survive because we're going to have a confrontation in a little bit and a dark figure, a silhouette, will throw a weapon to help you with it. And it's heavily implied that the silhouette who throws you the weapon is Ada because Leon says, Ada, is that you? And it sounds like Ada. So, you know, if it walks like... And also, who the hell else is around here at this point? It's not Claire. Um, so, you know, if it talks like Ada, walks like Ada, quacks like Ada, Machiavellian gaslights Leon like Ada, then it's probably Ada. So, one thing I do like about this ending section, though, is that the countdown starts before you get to the final fight. There's like actually a few puzzles you have to do beforehand, which gets you, you know, gets you rolling, gets you going. So, once you get through that point, you can't go back, well, you could go back to get different weapons, but you're going to run the timer down. So, it's best to get what you need prior to going through the gate. So with the two plugs we've just picked out from um, the section near the train, we're going to put those in and we're going to get ready for the, well, I say final fight, the penultimate fight. So rather than kill him, falling into the lava has only melted off his coat and you get this mutation forming showing the more animalistic side of the tyrant. Now when he does his sweep attack, he'll always use his left hand claw so you want to try and dodge to his right so you can get a blind side on him. So yeah, be very cautious with the recoil from it, but with the upgraded Magnum, it only takes three shots for you to get this gun. So don't just fire straight away. Try to look for your opening where you get a, enough time to aim it down and the rocket launcher will finish him off. Game over.
and a suitable 80s action quip or one-liner to finish him off. Ob obviously, you've got to go with something like that. So, although this is the penultimate fight, I would consider this like the real proper final fight because the actual final fight is a complete pushover by comparison. And I, I realise it probably seemed quite easy just from what you've seen there but trust me it took so many goddamn attempts to get it right it's he is very quick and if he gets you once he can put a lot of damage on you in a very short period of time so don't give him the opportunity to get close to you and start doing damage really move around and pick your shots make sure you always move to his right as he'll be attacking and swiping from his left. So try to move around in a clockwise fashion so you don't get tagged by him. So we're almost at the end of the game now. So I don't feel guilty about wasting um, a magnum round to uh, take out these few. But let's, let's use the machine gun to uh, put him to use. We've only really used this on uh, Mr. X previously. So just get, get a little bit of fun just mowing him down. Say hello to my little friend. Uh, I, I apologise, I won't have to do that again. Uh, the only things left to do once these zombies are taken out is to activate a console near the up upper point here, which will open up the gates allowing the train to move forward, and then activating the train proper by going inside. Now, there's a little bit of foreshadowing that we picked up on one of the files we read earlier. As you might recall, it mentioned the fact that under certain extenuating circumstances, escape might be denied and they might even stop the train itself, which is the kind of small print you want to double check for whenever you're signing a contract for a new job. Uh, totally not speaking from personal experience. So that's going to play into it. We're going to activate the liver and hopefully Claire will come and make it. Because we didn't, we didn't check to make sure Claire was here. We we're just like, fuck it, let's go. It's more dramatic that way. So one final encounter before the end, so let's see what stowaway we seem to have picked up on our escape. What was that? Warning, biohazardous outbreak imminent. The emergency system has been activated. This train will detonate. Repeat, this train will detonate. What's wrong? I don't know. The door won't open. So we don't get an opportunity to go to a safety deposit box before this final section. So I hope you've managed to keep enough ammunition from the previous encounter. Fortunately, we will have a rocket with us just as standard because we've only fired one to kill the boss. So we, ha we can use that to help us out a little bit. So this is the point where the game goes full John Carpenter's The Thing. 
William Birkin has regressed even further. This is his fifth form, and he's there's not even much that's discernible at this point. He's just a gelatinous mass of flesh and tissue and tentacles and whatnot. Fortunately, the actual fight itself isn't all that tricky because, well, he's just a mass of gelatinous bullshit, so he... It's not exactly mobile. All you want to do is just plug away at whatever weapons you happen to have at hand. And he doesn't really put up much of a fight. I'm not even certain what attacks he does have. Because I don't see him do any. I think it's just a case that he will slowly cr uh, pull himself to the other side of the train. And if you don't do enough damage in time, then he just engulfs you. I don't think he actually has an attack. So just fire into it. And then we a little bit of damage. Fire your rocket. And he is dealt with for once and for all. A little bit of a delay there on, on the rocket impacting and it actually taking him down. So that's him just dissolving now into a gloop of flesh and enzymes and liquid and vestigial biological mass and whatnot. Uh, but he's still not dead, we can assume, from uh, the, the final cutscene. He's still kicking in there, so we're going to have to blow up the whole train. So uh, let's just get on to the final cutscene. So, it's finally over. Sherry, you look terrible. No worse than you, Claire. Come on, time to leave. Now? What's wrong? Is something following us? We have to go. We don't have any time to waste. Go? Where? Hey, it's up to us to take out Umbrella. <laughs> And we are done, ending on a very out-of-place rock song to finish off the horror game. But yes, that is Resident Evil 2, uh, Leon Scenario B. So our heroes, Leon, Claire and Cherry, walk off into the sunset like a very cheesy action movie. Um, Ada presumed dead, but we totally know she isn't. William Birkin finally blown up and, well, Raccoon City... Uh, blown up into smithereens. Uh, the next time we see this actually is Resident Evil 3, which will be taking place during the same time period as Resident Evil 2. So it's going to take place during the downfall of um, 
Raccoon City. I suppose I shouldn't have said that the city blows up. I mean, all, all that blew up at the end of this is the Umbrella Lab. And I think technically it's like a day or two after the events of this game that Raccoon City just gets nuked. But um, for these characters, they're done. Claire goes on to try and find her brother and makes a reappearance in Resident Evil Code Veronica, which I still have to do the walkthrough for that. I've tried it a few times. I failed a few times. So uh, that's still a work in progress. And I'm pretty sure Resident Evil Code Veronica was actually meant to be Resident Evil 3. Uh, Resident Evil 3 was just kind of meant to be like a little bit of a stopgap. And funnily enough, it ended up being my all-time favourite out of the originals. Can't say the same about the remake, unfortunately. It's, it's quite strange, actually. Resident Evil 3 had a very short time period to be completed, and yet ended up being so good. And so it seems when they made the remake, they did exactly the same thing. The, the gap between the Resident Evil 2 remake and the Resident Evil 3 remake was so small because they reused a lot of assets. Um, and I guess they thought that, you know, they'd catch lightning in a bottle twice, except they didn't. Like, it, Resident Evil 3 is just okay. It's not a bad game, but it's a shell of what it could have been. But that's me bitching about it. I'm, I'll probably talk about more of it in the Resident Evil 3 commentary and you know talk about what stuff they they did took out for reasons fucking beyond my comprehension but for now we are done thank you very much for taking your time out of the day to uh, watch this um there's there's probably much more entertaining things you should be watching you chose this for some reason i appreciate it genuinely and with us having completed this without having used up any save files i haven't used them for any first aids and doing it under two hours we unlock ending A, or we get a grade of A at the end, which means we now have even more unlimited weapons unlocked. So we now have an unlimited machine gun alongside our unlimited rocket launcher, as well as um, an unlimited minigun, which you're never going to see me use because it's not in the main game. But yeah, thank you very much for watching, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye!